Hi, I'm Tim. Join me in this video as we go through a very recent change in discussions with the FAA where they will be allowing, in certain cases, higher altitudes than the 400 feet currently authorized with the remote ID ruling. Let's get to it. One of the big things that has changed or will change um, everything for model airplane flight, radar control models, or drones is the recent ruling by the FAA imposing a requirement for remote ID. Uh, for people new to remote ID, it kind of goes into three general areas. <clears throat> it was uh, directed by Congress in 2019 in an FAA Reauthorization Act. The FAA wrote a ruling. Uh, the final ruling came out in 2021. It had 54,000 uh, comments on it that led to the final ruling. And the idea of wrote remote ID is kind of like a digital license plate in the sky for drones and RC models. The FAA considers both drones and RC models to be pretty much the same thing for the ruling purposes. And what remote ID is a form of electronics that will do various things for your RC model and identify the location, the altitude, the airspeed, and it will also indicate where the model took off. The ruling will be put in stages for implementation. There is nothing, I repeat, nothing RC models have to do today with remote ID. The remote ID becomes effective on September 16th, 2023. Uh, this is being filmed on March 17th, 2023. But in the meantime, the three areas are manufacturers have to show compliance with remote ID as they build their drones, uh, drone aircraft for sale. The second thing is that there um, is allowance for a remote ID module that can be swapped between your various models. If you have an older model without the built-in remote ID, this will have the same function showing the location, altitude, speed, takeoff location, and so forth. And then the third item that will probably affect most modelers here are the, is the concept of a FRIA which is an FAA-recognized identification area. Uh, this is the idea behind FRIAs at various club airfields, school locations um, that's agreed to by the FAA. They can set aside an area where you can fly in the FRIA without the need for any remote ID. You just if you're in this FAA-approved FRIA, there's no need for remote ID, and that will affect a lot of us because there's about 2,500 AMA clubs out there in addition to very, uh, various educational institutions. Just one remark on the FRIAs. Um, per the FAA's ruling, it's actually in the law, <coughs> the FAA will not accept a request from an individual for a FRIA. It has to come from what they call a community-based organization. The AMA, the Academy of Model Aeronautics, was the first community-based organization listed for the FRIA. Um, AMA earned that back in November of 2022. So the AMA is literally working with the FAA to figure out procedures how to get the various clubs to apply and be granted FRIA status. There's about 2,500 clubs, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, information has been sent out to the club officers. There are no FRIAs established as of this time. That is still a work in progress. But remember, there is no need to comply with a remote ID till September 16th, 2023. I'll discuss that a little bit later in the video if that is not completed by then. So the purpose of this video is the increase in altitudes for um, radio control model flight drones and airplanes. And what I'd like to have folks understand in this video is that the idea of negotiation, um, the FAA is doing something very different with this remote ID. Just uh, the idea of a module or electronics to track model aircraft is very new. Uh, there's a lot of people with older systems who won't have that. So there was a early form of negotiation with the FAA with the 54,000 comments that went into place. There were various organizations involved in this. It could be the Experimental Aircraft Organization, the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association, the Academy of Model Aeronautics. They worked with the FAA to implement this remote ID ruling, hence the changes from all these comments. For the full-size aircraft, they were very concerned about excess regulations, regulated airspace to accommodate model aircraft. On the other hand, the AME wanted to make sure they had their voice at the table, that we weren't um, essentially grounded by too many rules for the remote ID. And so what we have now is the remote ID rule. It is not a final ruling in the sense that nothing can ever change. 
the way it works with the FAA, because they handle so many different types of flyers, from Cessnas to United Airlines, commercial flyers, and so forth, the FAA is constantly making exceptions and adjustments to account for different types of flying. And this is what's happening uh, with the remote ID ruling. So the latest thing to come out from the Academy of Model Aeronautics, the email was March 8th of 2023, is a um, exemption and work for sanctioned AMA events. So right now, as part of the working with the AMA, the remote ID rule, the maximum altitude for radar control model airplane flight is 400 feet. And that's awful low. A lot of people are wanting to go higher, sailplane pilots and so forth. So what you try to do with these situations with the FAA or any government organization is instead of just demanding this, that or the other, you try to explain to them the problem, why you think this is a problem, and what is very helpful in these discussions is to offer them a solution in those discussions, which is what the AMA did. And so what the AMA did to kind of help the FAA move along in this process is why don't we allow for sanctioned contests on a case-by-case -case basis to improve the altitude for the contest to either 700 feet above ground level or 1,200 feet above ground level. The different altitudes depending on where Group E, uh, controlled airspace, is in that uh, flying area for the various contests. But this was acceptable to the FAA, and the AMA has established a process whereby sanctioned contests can apply with appropriate lead time to get the maximum altitude increased from 700 feet to potentially 1,200 feet for these AMA events. Now that might not sound like a lot, but you, the a journey of a thousand steps begins with the first one. So this is a just an example of how you can discuss a problem or a concern of yours with the government, in this case the FAA, to try to get some sort of improvement uh, for your flying activities that does not affect the safety of other flying activities. In this case, the 400 feet was a relatively arbitrary altitude set years ago. The idea was, generally speaking, light aircraft don't fly below 500 feet above ground level. There are um, uh, what, what the FAA calls um, sparsely populated areas. You can go down to 500 feet away from people and um, objects. You can be quite low to the ground, but 500 feet was kind of considered the lowest altitude. So 400 feet for models was just a 100-foot buffer. There's no way to measure it. You just have to look at it. Maybe in the old days of RC models, that was acceptable. These days, with high-performance aircraft, sailplanes, and so forth, they go a lot higher. So here is a case where it was a reasonable discussion for uncontrolled aircraft to go up to 700 feet to 1,200 feet AGL for AMA-sanctioned events. If you have any further questions on details on this, if you're contest director, the AMA, the AMA has a um, frequently asked questions information sheet, and you can Google it for higher altitudes for AMA sanctioned events, sanctioned events in uncontrolled airspace. That'll answer a lot of your questions: who you contact, how you can get this, what the lead times are, and so forth. But the important point to take away from this um, initial granting of higher altitudes for sanctioned events is the remote ID is going to be a work in progress. It's a big change, and there's going to be a lot of variations. One of the good things about remote ID with the FAA, in the past, the FAA had a very strict technical compliance that everybody had to meet to meet a certain requirement, transponders or whatever. Because the remote ID is so new, the FAA did not mandate how, how much it should weigh, what its power was. It just described what the remote ID capability should do and would allow manufacturers to come up with solutions to that. There is a listing on the FAA website of manufacturers that have complied with the FAA rulings for the remote ID. There's probably about 70 of these manufacturers um, listed so far. It lists the drones, the certificate, everything required to understand if that drone is compliant as it's being manufactured. But the um, thing to understand is this idea of negotiation. A good example with the FAA of a negotiation that took place was the size of registration numbers on aircraft. We're all familiar with the N number. The N stands for any aircraft registered in the United States. They painted on the side of the aircraft in 12-inch letters. This was imposed as a policy in 1981. The idea was 
When you fly in the national airspace system, you just have to be identified. Your plane has to be identified. So they want letters big enough that they can be read by the ground. And also, with these large letters, if you fly into an ADIS, which is an aircraft defense, an aircraft defense identification zone, which are located off the coast of all countries, including the United States and international airspace, you can't have restricted airspace and international airspace. This way, if an aircraft is flying in an air defense identification zone, they're intercepted by military aircraft, they can pull up information alongside the aircraft, read the identification number to later identify who the pilot is on that. The problem with those 12-inch letters were the people that would fly warbirds didn't like them because you have a P-51 or some other uh, older military aircraft, you don't want 12-inch letters on the side like a billboard. It just takes away from the whole effect of looking at the airplane. So what had happened, much as we are doing now with remote ID, organizations interested in warbirds met with the FAA to try to figure out if there was a compromise or alternative way to have registration numbers on these military aircraft. The two groups were the eight EAA, which is the Experimental Aircraft Association, Warbirds of America, and the Confederate Air Force, now the Commemorative Air Force. Back in 1981, they said, is it possible to have two inch registration numbers painted under the stab as opposed to the 12 inch numbers? We know we need the numbers, but two inches under the stab, uh, we think that would look okay. And the FAA says, reasonable request, and what they negotiated was there were three requirements for these warbirds. The aircraft had to be at least 30 years old. The second one, the aircraft had to be under 12,500 pounds of weight, and the aircraft had to be painted in an authentic uh, wartime paint scheme. So a very good example is the L4 Grasshopper. That's the wartime variant of the Piper Cub. Uh, the Army bought about 4,000 of those for World War II for artillery spotting, uh, liaison work um, uh, between very remote uh, flying sites. And you can see, here's a registration number for a regular Cessna with a 12 inch letters on it. But when we go to the uh, grasshopper, very nice um, example of the grasshopper here. You can just barely see it in this shot, but the letters are right underneath the horizontal stab. Here's a close up and you can see the end number a little bit more detailed. That's an example of discussing with the FAA, describing the problem, and offering a reasonable solution on the way ahead, much as we are trying to do with remote ID. So I can see other changes possible with remote ID ruling. Remember, we don't have to do anything for remote ID until September 16th, 2023. Uh, that's when the remote ID ruling kicks in. I've had a lot of comments, feedback on my videos that, for example, the FAA is way behind the paperwork. There's 2,500 AMA clubs. There is no way that they're going to get all 2,500 clubs approved with a FRIA status. And if you're one of those clubs that is not approved on September 16th, you're effectively grounded from flying your RC model aircraft unless you have the uh, built-in or remote ID module. And I understand that and I agree with that. My sense is there are no FRIAs established right now. The AMA is working on a process. They're putting out the information to the club officers. They're preparing that for the FAA. If it looks like we're getting close to September 16th, 2023, and there is a delay or there's a lot of unapproved clubs for the FAA recognized identification area, my belief, my sense is, having seen these situations before, the FAA will simply delay that September 16th, 2023 date until a later time such that the clubs are uh, covered by the FRIA rule. I, there's nothing compelling about that September 16th date where it has to be done. That was just a reasonable estimate for compliance that could easily be slipped until everybody has their FRIA or there's some delay with the remote ID um, for flying at that time. So because remote ID is so important for drone and RC model airplane flying, let's just take a quick review. Again, this is being filmed in March uh, 17th, 2023, of where we are with a remote ID. As I mentioned earlier, there are three areas. The re uh, manufacturers building it in on the factory, the remote ID module, and the FAA recognized identification, uh, identification area. For the manufacturers building their modules, I think they're in pretty good shape. As I mentioned, the FAA has on their website a listing of about at least 70 manufacturers that have models that comply with the um, 
necessary remote ID technical requirements set forth by the FAA. So that is progressing pretty well, I believe. That obviously has to be done by September 16th. We'll probably see more ads, marks on boxes, whatever, but I think the manufacturing of the remote ID for drones coming out of the factory is in pretty reasonable shape. The second area is the remote ID module. This is where you buy a module, <clears throat> you swap it between various airplanes to be remote ID compliant. Right now there are two manufacturers, this is from the FAA website, that have compliant remote modules. I know one of them I've seen ads for them around $300, which is ridiculous. Nobody's going to buy a module for that amount of money. It's been fairly quiet. I haven't seen a lot of talk about it. So I am quite sure that there will be reasonably priced remote ID modules we'll be able to buy. There's none out there right now. We'll just have to wait to see how that, how that turns out. Uh, as we get closer to the September 16th, 2023 uh, requirement date to be compliant with remote ID, <clears throat> we should have more information by that time. And the third area is the FRIA, the FAA Recognized Identification Area. Again, when you fly in a FRIA, it's just like we've been flying for the past 40 or 50 years. There's no need for remote ID if you're flying a model within visual sight at a FRIA area, which would be uh, your local AMA club, <clears throat> some educational institutions, uh, areas sponsored by community-based organizations like the FAA. If, the, um, the, if all the FRIAs are not done by September 16th, I can see it would be very reasonable that there will be a delay in the implementation date of September 16th. But I think the FRIAs are a very interesting one. It's just a paperwork exercise. There's no technical issues that have to be solved. And I think the AMA is leading. I, I know the AMA is leading on this for the uh, understanding, description, and implementation of the process for community-based organizations to apply for and get the FAA recognized identification area. So I do get a lot of questions. Well, gee, I am living out in the middle of nowhere. Um, I own some farmland, whatever. There's no close by AMA club. Why should I just not be able to fly in my backyard or, or farmland, wherever I'm being, if I am in controlled airspace and I don't bother anybody else? To me, that is a reasonable question. Right now, the answer is no from the FAA, but I would say that as we get into an understanding of exemptions for contest, FRIAs are in place and working, and the idea is that there is some control over where people are flying their models. There could be places, there could be instances where um, on a case-by-case -case basis, other areas could essentially be declared as a FRIA for RC model airplane flying. We're not there yet. We'll just have to see how that evolves. But again, this idea of negotiating with the FAA to get the outcome that you want is a very helpful thing as we progress with the remote ID ruling. So in conclusion, thank you for tuning in on this video. Um, the remote ID ruling is an important thing for RC flying. We've got about six months to go until the September 16th, 2023 um, due date for that. The FRIAs are going to be very important for club flying, also the remote ID module. When the first lightweight affordable ones come out, that will be a game changer as well because once you have one of these modules, you can swap it between your models and you are remote ID compliant anywhere you're flying outside of controlled airspace. So more to follow to get more information. Thank you for watching this and we'll look forward to seeing you in future videos.